Hey, welcome to chapter six. We're gonna be going over inventory and cost of sales, but before I begin, I'm gonna explain my shirt. So one semester I had a class that uh, gave me a little bit of extra grief about how I can't spell. So I ended up getting this shirt here that says, I'm gonna, you know, can't spell, I'm an accountant. So he said, I'm just, I'm good with numbers. So anyway, funny little shirt I picked up along my way uh, of being an accountant. So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, Let's uh, go over chapter six. So we're going to be talking about inventories primarily here. Let me get the PowerPoint slide going for us. <clears throat> All right. Uh, there's our learning objectives. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to be able to identify and value our inventory. And how do we do that? Um, so the first question is, what is our inventory? So our inventory is anything that we currently own. It doesn't necessarily mean we have it in our physical possession. One of, so what we got to do is identify any items that we have that will um, that that we own that we got to have an inventory. So that is going to include any goods in transit that are FOB shipping point. So when we purchase something, if it's FOB shipping point we got to include it in our inventory for what we own also goods in transit for anything that we sold that was fob destination so if we've sent something to a customer but the ownership doesn't transfer until they receive it we're going to include those as well uh so i don't know if any of you guys have ever spent some time up in prescott or other little smaller communities they tend to have a lot of little stores lining their main main roads, um, and they have a whole bunch of little just trinkety things, little tags on there. And when you go buy something from there, they take the little tag and then they do the transaction. Um, if you just if you were curious as to what that was all about, is what's happening is that people are coming in and saying, "Hey, I'd like to have a little section of this this space and sell my goods on consignment." Um, so the place is going to is going to be a facilitator to sell items and so when we have items on consignment we own those goods until they're sold the person or place that has them at the time is going to be considered a sales representative or somebody that's there to facilitate a sale so we include those in our inventory until they are sold and then lastly, goods that are damaged or obsolete. And we need to keep these things and we need to identify that they're part of our inventory, but we need to value them correctly. And I want to emphasize this again, we are going to value them at the lower of cost or market. So if we have damaged or obsolete goods, uh, we are going to value them at whatever they're actually worth at that point. Uh, goods and transit, I, I guess I've already talked about all these. So um, you can pause these and read the slides, but I've already kind of gone over each one of these. Um, goods on consignment. The consignor is the one who is selling the items. The consignee is the person that physically possesses them and has them for sale. But the consignor is like the company that's put these inventory out on the shelves. And that's kind of what you want to know is who's the consignor and who's the consignee. And then the damaged goods and items. Um, net realizable value is the way we identify it as the lower, it's, it's um, market is net realizable value sales minus the sell, sales price minus the selling costs. Um, and then we were gonna record a loss if it's damaged or obsolete uh, situation. So for example, if I had an iPod one, right? The Nobody even does iPods anymore, I don't think. And um, if I have like 20 of them in my inventory, if I, if I can sell them, then I'm going to take the sales price minus the selling cost for its net realizable value. But if they're obsolete, I'm just going to write them off as a loss. So whatever the cost was to them, I'm just going to take a loss on it. All right, so what do we do to determine how much inventory costs are assigned to our inventory? Uh, this is a great slide, just kind of identifying that. First, our inventory costs are going to be our inventory, the actual physical inventory we have, minus any discounts or anything else, 
um, that we took as far as uh, returns and allowances. And then we're going to add in any other costs that it took to get our inventory and to get it to a sellable condition. That may include shipping, storage, uh, taxes, sales tax should be included in inventory. Um, uh, any insurance, uh, import duties or tariffs, anything that it takes to get it into a workable condition, a sellable condition. And if you get the inventory and then have to do some more work on it, so for example, if you, um, and we'll get in this in accounting uh, 212, but if you were to buy, uh, let's say, parts for a bicycle, you're a manufacturer, not a merchandiser, but if you were to get the parts for bicycle and then the cost it took to build that bicycle would also be inventory. But that's manufacturing, not merchandisers, and we're focused on merchandisers right now. All right. So um, here, one of the aspects that we want to go over in Chapter 6 also is internal controls and um, things that we can implement for internal controls. What we want to do is we want to be able to track our inventory and make sure that we keep a good handle over what our inventory is doing, making sure we have account for it, making sure we know how much is in there, what it's valued at. So some of these controls would be to use inventory tickets that are pre-numbered. Um, these pre-numbered tickets means that somebody can't go in there and fudge numbers, void a inventory ticket without somebody knowing, things like that. Um, you want people to go count the inventory, preferably people that have nothing to do with inventory. In other words, you don't want me counting and saying what kind of inventory we have if I'm also receiving the inventory and keeping track of it that way. Um, you want to have several different people to count the same stuff. And then uh, the manager can do a spot check, things like that. So we have four different inventory costing methods that we're going to use. The first is specific identification. It's probably, in my opinion, the easiest. Uh, then we have our first in, first out, or FIFO. Then we have our last in, first out, which we call LIFO. And then the last one's weighted average. These inventory cost flow methods basically shift the costs to varying aspects as to whichever the company wants to exploit, all right? Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that. In a period of steadily rising costs, the first in first out method is going to yield a high net income, thus a high net uh, or a high net income, which thus increases the taxability of the company. It's also going to have a high ending inventory. So um, if you're looking for profitability, if you're looking for um, maintaining a high current ratio, that might be your better bet. Last in, first out yields a um, a uh, low ending inventory and a low net income, thus low income taxes. So uh, you have your older things in your ending inventory, as opposed to FIFO has the newer stuff that you purchased. Um, so so if you're looking to pay less taxes, LIFO may be your option. And then the weighted average is, is in a period of steadily rising costs is going to be right there in the middle. All right, it's going to stand right, it's going to land right in between these two uh, methods. Uh, the, the, the specific identification method basically says we can track our inventory so accurately that we know exactly what we sold from how and how much it cost. So we can specifically identify each item and the cost we paid for it. So there is no need for any of these inventory costing methods you see on this slide. Uh, because we know exactly what we spend on the inventory and we can track it and it's cost effective for us and things like that. Uh, something that would, a company that would use specific identification method would be a company that has high ticket items, uh, would sell um, like maybe diamonds or, you know, precious metals, things like that, because they'll know exactly how much they paid for each, pre each piece, especially if it's custom jewelry. Custom jewelry especially is going to be the uh, the one that you would see in that. A uh, reminder about the cost flow of our inventory. We take our beginning inventory, we add our net purchases, and that's going to equal our merchandise available for sale. If you also take your ending inventory and add your cost of goods sold to that, you will also equal your merchandise available for sale. And once again, I can uh, give you three of these aspects, and algebraically, you should be able to identify the other two factors in this.
All right, so let's talk inventory methods using each of these methods. And we'll start off with talking about our perpetual system, okay? Perpetual inventory system, again, means we're constantly updating our inventory. After each transaction, we're gonna update it. That's the perpetual inventory system. Um, when we have inventory, we're gonna have two statements, financial statements that it mainly impacts. That's gonna be the balance sheet displaying our ending inventory and our income statement displaying our cost of the goods we sold. Um, there's an argument about that it impacts cash because if you sell something, you're gonna receive cash too. So your cash flow statement will also experience an impact, but we're focused on these other two financial statements. Here is an example of our perpetual inventory system. Notice that we are going to be updating each thing after each transaction. So we have beginning inventory, 10 units. Our inventory unit, we have 10 units. Second purchase or our, our purchase on August 3rd, we're updating our unit inventory right away. We have a sale on August 14th, we're updating our units right away. We're constantly updating these and we're keeping track of how much it cost us. So you can see we have 55 out of the whole year, we had 55 units available to sell and our cost of goods that were available for sale was 5,990. We know we sold 43 units and we know that we have 12 units left. This is just a good example of how it flows. Now, using the specific identification method in the perpetual inventory system, this is how we're going to do it. We bought, uh, or we have our beginning inventory on August 1st, and then we purchased the units on August 3rd. Notice how we're gonna show how many units we bought, what cost it was that we paid for, and in our ending inventory, we're gonna show uh, how much we have of each one. So, when we sold these units, we knew we sold 43 units. And what we can do is we can come in here and say, hey, of these units that we sold, we sold all of the units that were $91 each, all of them that were $106 each. We sold 15 of the 20 we paid $115 for, and three of the units we paid $119 for. So we can specifically come in here and say each one, we knew how much it was that we sold them for. And then we can go to our ending inventory and show what's left over. Now FIFO is going to use and sell whatever we bought first, our oldest costs. So in a period of steadily rising costs, we're gonna have our oldest costs, and which is our cheaper cost, go to cost of goods sold. Thus, we're gonna have a higher net income than if we use the LIFO method. Uh, recent costs are gonna be in our ending inventory, which means our, exp our expensive inventory is gonna be uh, in our ending inventory. And this is what it looks like. We have our beginning balance. Notice on this one is a little different. Uh, this is showing our perpetual inventory system and how we're accounting uh, for our inventory balances and everything else. We have our goods purchased, we have our cost of goods sold, and then we have our inventory balances, we carry it out. Don't get hung up on this one. I want you to focus on, oh, oh, they took that slide out from the old setup. Okay, that's fine. Um, we have our goods purchased, we have our cost of goods sold, we have our inventory balance. So um, when we sold 20 units on August 14th, we're gonna pull and start from the first lot that we had. And in this case, it was the $91 unit uh, lot, so or $91 lot. So we're gonna pull units from there until either we fill the order or we use up all of that lot. In this case, we used it all up because we bought, we sold 20 units. So we're gonna pull 10 from that first lot and we're gonna pull 10 from the August 3rd lot that we uh, spent $106 on. That's gonna leave us five units from the 106 lot left. We're gonna make two additional purchases on August 28th, therefore, or on August 17th and August 28th. So on August 28th, we have three lots left over, five at 106, 20 at 115, 10 at 119. And on August 30th, we uh, sell uh, 23 units. So we're gonna pull five from our 106. And because we have enough in the second lot, we're gonna pull 18 out of there. You're gonna see our cost of goods sold is totaled up there and our inventory balance has the two units from the 115 lot and 10 from the 119 lot. Last in first down method is gonna do the exact opposite of FIFO. It's gonna take everything that we bought first 
and uh, most recently, and then we're going to sell that first. So in this case, we're going to, uh, on August 1st and August 3rd, it's going to be the same. But on August 14th, we're selling from that lot of 106 first, fill up that order, or use all that lot, which we end up using all that lot. So we're going to have five units left of the $91 lot. And notice how we never sell those five units at $91 because we're selling the most recent ones first. And then in the weighted average, the way we calculate this is we take the cost of our goods available for sale at each sale and divide it by the number of units available for sale. That's how we do the weighted average, okay? So after each purchase, we weight it. We go ahead and come up with a new dollar per unit and take that dollar per unit on our sales and just multiply it straight over. So instead of breaking it off in each lot on the cost of goods sold we did in FIFO and LIFO, we're just going to take the $2,100 in this situation because we calculated that when we added both lots together from our beginning balance and the purchase on August 3rd, when we combined the total number of units and the total costs, we take the total cost divided by the total units and get $100 per unit. The, 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 this shows you that we had $2,500. So if you take 10 times 91 and 15 times 106, it's going to equal 2,500. That's 25 units. So we're going to take 2,500 divided by 25 units. It's going to be $100 uh, dollars per unit. So when we go to make a sale, it's going to be just that total number of units times our weighted average. So here's your example. Uh, and, you know, it, it could continue on as they showed it before. When we bought on August 17th, we then reweight it. We take again our total number of costs. We have five units left at $100. Take 20 at 115. We reweight it. Now we're at $112 per unit. Uh, we make another purchase. We're now $114 per unit. And then when we go to sell on August 30th, we're going to sell them at $114 per unit. So let's look at this. First in, first out, our ending inventory approximates current costs and has a, a higher net income. Last in, first out, cost of goods sold approximates current costs. So you're going to have a lower net income. Again, this is in a period of steadily rising costs, which that's what we really live in. I mean, every now and again, the costs dip down. But in aggregate, when you look at the whole thing, it's constantly increasing. And the weighted average smooths out your price changes. So looking at the examples we did in these other, um, when we calculated it all, look at our cost of goods sold. Um, see how specific identification and weighted average will land right in between FIFO and LIFO every single time. Now specific identification um, is closer to FIFO in this situation because if you'll remember, we pulled most of it from the first two lots and then filled in the second or filled in the rest of the um, transactions from the later lots. And that's okay. Uh, sometimes we'll sell all the later ones before we sell the earlier ones. And so specific identification will be closer than LIFO. But in a period of steadily rising costs, cost of goods sold will never be lower except in FIFO and will never be higher except in LIFO. FIFO and LIFO are kind of your, um, your parameters, your barriers. But now, if the costs are going up and down constantly, all that's out the door. But we focus on a period of steadily rising costs because mainly that's really what we're, the world we're living in. Uh, again, and notice the inventory too, FIFO and LIFO are your parameters as well. Um, yeah, you can't, you can't switch between FIFO and LIFO uh, uh, you know, people think of the darndest things. You, you can't, you can't for tax purposes say LIFO so that you have a lower net income, and then for financial reporting say FIFO because you want to show a bigger net income. Not going to work that way. Not going to work that way. You got to use, you got to, you got to follow the same thing. Okay, so enough with that. And I'm going to have a snippet on on really how to do these FIFO and LIFO methods. I know that that lecture part's kind of just there, but. Don't worry about it. Um, if it didn't come to you right away, watch my inventory uh, snippet video and I think it'll make things a little bit more clear. 
Compute the lower cost your market. I, I'm not going to probably make you do a whole lot of this, but basically you take the item, whatever its cost was, and you subtract out um, the selling costs, and that's what you're going to get. You, you can use replacement cost if you want. Bottom line is, if, as long as you have a good definition as to which one you use, then you're fine. Um, errors on future financial statements. Um, it's good to know this because at some point, after year two, everything washes out. Whenever there's an error in inventory, it always gets washed out by the time it's in year three. But you got to know and understand that when you when you understate ending inventory, it's going to overstate cost of goods sold and understate net income in year one, um, and then understate cost of goods sold and overstate net income in year two, uh, and then conversely if you overstate it. So. Kind of know the reasoning behind it. Look at these numbers, kind of really go over those um, and, and understand why that's the case. It, it'll help you. Um, but I, I mean, I could give you a snippet. I pro I'm not going to though, just because um, this is one of those situations that even on the CPA exam, it took me a while to just fully really, I really just had to just think about it and how it works. Um, if you think about it, if you get money in, and when you say on your reports, you got this amount of money, and then you say your costs were this high, let's say $500, but it should have been $600, you're saying you got more money at the end after you take your income minus your expenses than you really do. So you're understating your net income, right? Because you overstated your expense or you're understated your expenses that's kind of what we're trying to look at so if i so I'm, I'm looking at year one here if i understate cost of goods sold i'm going to overstate net income and that's what happens when we screw up our inventory that's why inventory is so important so um and then how it affects the balance sheet well if you're if you're understating your ending inventory you're understating everything and if you're overstating ending inventory you're overstating everything um, just know this exists. The inventory turnover is cost of goods sold divided by average in the inventory, uh, in uh, your average inventory, um, and, and day sales, just, just kind of know these exist, maybe know how to calculate them just, but in accounting 112, we get into these a lot more, uh, precisely. So, um, I'm not going to go over necessarily the periodic inventory system with these methods, but the bottom line is it's, it's, in my opinion, it's easier because you're going to be taking everything at the end of the unit, at the end of the year, okay, or at the end of the accounting period. It 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 um, it doesn't update after every transaction. So you basically take all your cost of goods available, and then how many of them you sold. And if you're using the specific identification, you should still get the same thing. But if you're using the FIFO, then it doesn't matter when the purchase happened because you're just going to start taking from the first ones, and your ending inventory is whatever it is, okay. Same thing with the LIFO. And then the weighted average, you're just gonna take the weighted average at the end of the year and then apply that same cost to the, the costs. So it is kind of easier, um, but uh, anyways, that's kind of how that works. All right, so that's it. I'm not gonna go over the gross method. Um, there's only one slide on it anyway, but um, that's chapter six. Now, again, if some of this confuses you, don't get crazy, don't get worried. Just watch some of my snippet videos. If you still don't get it, I'll be happy to go over it with you. Um, but let me give you your word for today is home, H-O-M-E. Like, I like to have a home. I love to go home. Uh, I don't want to go home. Home is where the heart is. Home is where you hang your hat, whatever, H-O-M-E. Um, and, uh, and that's all I have for Chapter 6 in this video. I hope you guys have a great day. We'll see you guys in other videos. Take care.